Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, a fantastic guest. It is another episode of Living Theosophy on Sunday night in collaboration with the TSC, the Theosophical Society headquarters out of London, England, and the all-new Virtual Center for Theosophical Studies, which is an international center of the Theosophical Society committed to making known the teachings of theosophy via the internet to youth around the world, especially 45 years of age and under. So we're currently in the process of looking for volunteers made up of Theosophical Society members, or if you're not a member, that's fine too. If you'd like to be a part of it, click the link that I've included in the description down below. And I'd like to remind you that this was recorded in advance. So although it is premiering and we are live in the comment section with you down below, remember that this has been recorded so we can't stop for questions. But if you do have any questions, we will be in the comments as it is a live premiere here on YouTube. So that's how we're doing it now. We're taping it in advance and, and then premiering it live so we can join you because we wanna give the questions that you have and any commentary that comes up during the presentation, the attention that it deserves. So before we get started, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that. And meanwhile, let's get to it. I love her so much. She's one of my favorite people in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight is Petra Meyer. She is the president of the Blavatsky Lodge out of London, and she has a phenomenal presentation for us tonight. It is on the origin of everything, really, the cosmos. It is cosmogenesis that is our subject tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the one and only Petra Meyer. Hi, Petra, how are you? Oh, thank you so much, Anne. So I would like to start with a scientist. Frank Close, Emeritus Professor of Physics from the University of Oxford, started his book Antimatter with a reference from Genesis. And he wrote, in the beginning there was nothing. There was darkness on the face of the void. Then came a burst of energy, let there be light. And there was light, though from where it came, I don't know, he says. What we do know is what happened next. This energy coagulated into matter and its mysterious opposite antimatter in perfect counterbalance. Ordinary matter is the familiar stuff which makes air, rocks and living things. But matter's faithful opposite, identical in all respects except that deep inside its atoms, Everything is back to front is unfamiliar. This is antimatter, the antithesis of matter. Mm -hmm. Today, antimatter does not exist normally, at least on Earth, a vanishing act that is one of the unexplained mysteries of the universe. But we know that antimatter is real because scientists have made small pieces of it. With antimatter, the negative image of matter we make contact with the gods of creation, he says. Here we begin to see how our universe emerged from the Big Bang. Matter has a mirror image, antimatter. This is an amazing statement from an eminent scientist, and he is by far not the only one. Has science with the discovery of antimatter penetrated into the astral light? The astral light is not a universally diffused stuff, but pertains to our Earth and all other bodies of the system on the same plane of matter with it. Our astral light is, so to speak, the linga sharira, or the aerial body of our Earth. Only instead of being its primordial prototype, as in the case of our shaya or dapple, it is the reverse. While the human and animal bodies grow and develop in the model of their antitypal doubles, it is the astral light that is born from the terrain emanations, grows and develops after its prototypal parent, and reflects everything reversed in its treacherous wave, both from the upper planes and from its lower solid plane, the Earth. And again, HPV says, under astral prakritic consciousness, or nature in its primeval condition, objects are reversed. This again illustrates the delusive character of this plane. With the discovery of the perplexing subatomic world at the turn of the 20th century, 
Many scientists have turned to Eastern mysticism for inspiration. The British Nobel Prize laureate Bertrand Russell, philosopher, mathematician, historian, and political activist, for example, once wrote in a fortnightly philosophical magazine called Manas, the greatest men who have been philosophers have felt the need both of science and mysticism. The attempt to harmonize the two was what made their life. And in an article called The World as I See It, published in the American magazine, The New Yorker in November 1947, Albert Einstein said, how can an educated person stay away from the Greeks? I've always been far more interested in them than in science. I maintain that cosmic religious feeling is the strongest and noblest incitement to scientific research. And in a conversation with Dr. Fritjof Capra, an Austrian-born American physicist, Werner Heisenberg, one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, told Dr. Capra that he had spent some time in India in 1929 as a guest of the celebrated Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore, with whom he had long conversations about science and Indian philosophy. This introduction to Indian thought brought Heisenberg great comfort. He began to see that the recognition of relativity, interconnectedness and impermanence as fundamental aspects of physical reality, which had been so difficult for him and his fellow physicists, was the very basis of the Indian spiritual tradition. After these conversations, some of the ideas that had been so crazy suddenly made much more sense and were a great help to him, he said. These are just a few examples. The substratum of all world sciences, religions, and philosophies is theosophy, or divine wisdom, a term coined by the Alexandrian philosophers called Philalethians, the lovers of truth. The name dates back from the third century of our era and began with Ammonius Saccas and his disciples. Theosophy is pure divine ethics or dharma, a way of life as it is called in the world's oldest religion, Vedanta, the eternal tradition or the eternal way beyond human history. In their philosophy, Brahman is the impersonal supreme principle of the universe from the essence of which all emanates and into which all returns. It is immaterial and endless, pervading all. In other words, it is mystic space. This principle is either active or dormant in regular intervals as Manvantara, the active period from the Sanskrit root man or mind to think, symbolizing mankind as a whole, the self-existence or logos, followed by pralaya, an equal period of dissolution and rest which is so poetically called the days and nights of Brahma in Hindu philosophy. The appearance and disappearance of worlds is like a regular tidal lab of flux and reflux, the absolute universality of the law of periodicity, which physical science has observed and recorded in all departments of nature. It is one of the absolute fundamental laws of the universe as the secret doctrine and that includes the rebirth of the whole universe or cosmos. In a new study published in Physical Review Letters, Dr. Stephen Gielen from the Imperial College London and Dr. Neil Turok, director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada, have shown how a rebirth of the universe or a big bounce, as they call it, might be possible. In the early universe, as everything was incredibly small, it may have, may, may have been governed solely by the principle of quantum mechanics, rather than the large scale physics we are seeing today. Quantum mechanics deals with the mathematical description of the motion and interaction of subatomic particles. The model contains a few simple ingredients that are most likely to have formed the early universe. <clears throat> such as the fact that it was filled with radiation with almost no normal matter. 
With these, the model predicts that the effect of quantum mechanics would allow the universe to spring from a previous universe that was contracting rather than from a single point of broken physics. Dr. Turok said the big surprise in our work is that we could describe the earliest moments of the hot Big Bang quantum mechanically under very reasonable and minimal assumptions about the matter present in the universe. Under this assumption, the Big Bang was a big bounce in which contraction reversed to expansion. Sir Roger Penrose, Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Oxford University, also proposed that our universe is serial, that the Big Bang was preceded by a previous iteration, before that another one and so on, which is supported by the evidence from the cosmic microwave background radiation, and that physical constants, conscious precursors, and platonic values embedded in the fine structure of the universe mutate and evolve with each cosmological cycle. In other words, the whole universe is subject to evolution. The secret doctrine describes this event with the following words. Nature runs down and disappears from the objective plane only to reemerge after a time of rest out of the subjective and to reascend once more. Our cosmos and nature will run down only to reappear on a more perfect plane after every pralaya or rest. In the Kabbalistic works will be found the very history of the evolution of those countless globes which evolve after a periodical pralaya or rest, rebuilt from old material into new forms. The previous globes disintegrate and reappear transformed and perfected for a new phase of life. In the Kabbalah, worlds are compared to sparks which fly under the hammer of the great architect, which is law, the law which rules all the smaller creators. The collective or universal mind, which is composed of various and numberless hosts of creative powers are all governed by law. However, infinite in manifested time, this universal mind is still finite when contrasted with the unborn and undecaying space in its supreme essential aspect. And since that which is finite cannot be perfect, it is subject to evolution and progress. Nothing seems to be absolutely perfect under finite conditions. There's always room for improvement and new opportunities. Another aspect seems to be studying and learning from reflection. Since the energy behind creativity cannot be suppressed, it is always finding your outlet and challenge. One has to acquire true self-consciousness or paramartha in order to understand samriti or the origin of delusion, says the secret doctrine. Paramartha is a compound of two Sanskrit words, parama, which means above everything, and asa means comprehension. Paramasa is the synonym of the Sanskrit term svasam vedana, or the reflection which analyzes itself. Then it seems it is improving itself by constantly building new forms of refined expression to achieve the goal of perfection on different levels of consciousness and existence. The Pashamama Alliance is a global community that offers a chance to learn, connect, engage, travel, and cherish life for the purpose of creating a sustainable future that works for all. One of their close allies is the gifted New Mexican medicine man, Arkan Lushwala, a strong advocate for the protection of the sacred headwaters of the Amazon basin, working with the indigenous people. Rushwala and these native people never lost their strong connection with nature. They still know that high frequency vibrations activate consciousness, nourish, heal, and invite the most luminous forces in nature. Rushwala's theory is that the humans who designed the pyramids and ancient temples in Egypt, Guatemala, Peru, and other places built a world on earth which was like a mirror 
where the cosmic dance could reflect itself and resonate, and where all beings could receive the nourishment of this vibration. The ideology of the Pashamama Alliance is evolutionary activism based on the idea that we humans are aware of evolution <clears throat> and our place in the circle of life, that we are the universe becoming aware of itself, also pointing to the ancient wisdom that we are meant to be caretakers of the earth and our extraordinary responsibility to create a better world for all beings. Mm. This wisdom also resonates with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist with the American Museum of Natural History, who once said, I look up at the night sky and I know that yes, we are part of this universe. We are in this universe, but perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us. Nobel Prize laureate Professor Frank Wilczek from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology wrote in his book, A Beautiful Question, nature's technology whereby she builds the material world is quite advanced. Fortunately, nature lets us study her tricks. By paying close attention, we ourselves become magicians. In the voice of the silence, as it explains this process with the following word, help nature and work with her. And nature will regard thee as one of her creators and make obeisance. And she will open wide before thee the portals of her secret chambers. Lay bare before thy gaze the treasures hidden in the very depths of her pure virgin bosom. Unsullied by the hand of matter, she shows her treasures only to the eye of the spirit the eye which never closes, the eye for which there is no veil in all her kingdom. What does the divine wisdom tell us about the rebirth of the universe and how does science complement these teachings by now? There was nothing, wrote Professor Close in his above-mentioned book, and theosophy confirms. There's neither space nor time when the first logos or sound of the verbum appears. Duration is always, it is eternal, but it is outside of space and time. Once it is differentiated, it is all in space and time. The expansion of the universal matrix, which is not an expansion of a small center of focus, but a development of limitless subjectivity into limitless objectivity, not being an increase in size, but a change of condition, originating from the last vibration of the seventh eternity, or last period of activity that thrills through infinitude when a new manvantara or active period is about to begin. And this last vibration announcing a new dawn is synonymous with the first unmanifested logos at the time of the primordial radiation or the first light that appears. Space as an abstraction is endless, but in its concreteness and limitation, space becomes a representation of something. That is what the ancients called deity. In his book, The Elegant Universe, Brian Greene, professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia University in New York wrote, as the clock is turned back to earlier times, the whole of the cosmos is compressed to the size of an orange, a lemon, a pea, a grain of sand, and yet tinier size still. Extrapolation all the way back to the beginning, the universe would appear to have begun as a point in which all matter and energy is squeezed together, describing the whole of the universe, not just something within the universe. Carrying on to the beginning, there is simply no space outside of the primordial pinpoint. At the time of cosmic activity, a staggering number of years according to Hindu calculations between the periods of rest and activity, there starts a center of spiritual and conscious energy from Parabrahm, the Sanskrit term for the ever unknowable, attributeless and secondless reality 
or the impersonal, nameless, universal principle on which no speculation is possible. Not even esoteric philosophy can claim to know except by analogical inference that which took place before the reappearance of our solar system and previous to the last Mahapralaya, says the secret doctor. And the Mahatma Kutumi says that no adept has ever penetrated beyond this point or the veil of primitive cosmic matter. The highest, the most perfect vision is limited to the universe of form and matter and our solar system. This center of spiritual energy from the unknown source at the start of a new period of activity is unborn and eternal, acting through the Logos, symbolized by the point in the circle. The point in the circle is the unmanifested Logos. The manifested Logos is a triangle. Pythagoras speaks of the never manifested monad which lives in solitude and darkness. When the hour strikes, it radiates from itself one, the first number. This number descends, produces two, the second number, and two in its turn produces three, forming a triangle, the first complete geometrical figure in the world of form. It is this ideal or abstract triangle which is the point in the mundane egg, which, after gestation and in the third remove, will start from the cosmic egg, or Hiranyagaba in Sanskrit, to form the triangle. Let no one mistake the importance and potency of numbers as symbols. Everything in the universe was framed according to the eternal proportions and combinations of numbers. God or deity geometrizes, said Plato, and numbers and numerals are the fundamental basis of all systems of mysticism, philosophy and religion, confirms Madame Blavatsky in her collected writings. Numbers and geometrical figures are not an invention of the human mind. They are intrinsic in the fabric of the universe by which it manifests itself. According to Pythagoras, the world had been called forth of or out of chaos by sound and harmony, constructed according to the principles of musical proportions. And the Mahatma Kutumi confirms like every other orb of space our earth has before obtaining its ultimate materiality to pass through a gamut of seven stages of density. I say gamut advisedly since the diatonic scale best affords an illustration of the perpetual rhythmic motion of the descending and ascending cycle of Svabhavat, a Buddhist term for the matrix of the universe graduated as it is by tones and semitones. As every atom in every object of nature, animate or inanimate, sings its own keynote and produces its own sound and has its own color and number, confirms HPB. So every man, flower, tree and every celestial body is a play and interplay of sounds, both loud and faint, interblending in a marvelous symphony as well as being a beautiful intermingling of flashing and scintillating colors, which all have their own frequency of vibration which can be amplified and made audible. Tech Times is a digital media company which, is, which with its headquarters in New York City and one of the leading technology news sites on the internet reporting on new innovations. In an article, What Sound Does an Atom Make?, we can read about the latest technology used by scientists at Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. The team of scientists constructed a millimeter-long artificial atom and placed it on superconducting material to measure its electrical energy. Superconducting is the ability of a metal, for example allowing electricity to flow through it easily, especially at very low temperatures. They excited the atom along the material to detect sound waves using a microphone chip that had long metallic fingers, capturing and converting the acoustic waves so that they could see the sound in microwaves, one phonon at a time. 
The phonon is a qua quantum of energy or quasi-particle associated with a compressional wave, such as sound in a medium, like air or water. Although the sound amplitude or strength is very weak, by exciting an atom, it creates a sound, one phonon at a time. It is the weakest sound possible that can be detected. Published in the journal Science, the study confirmed that sounds are made any time by something that moves or vibrates, no matter how small the substance is. The scientists found that the artificial atom made a D note sound, about 20 octaves above the highest note on the piano and a pitch inaudible to the human ear. Frank Wilczek, Nobel Prize laureate and professor of physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, whom I've mentioned before, reminds us in his book, A Beautiful Question, Finding Nature's Deep Design, that matter is built up from atoms, which are in a precise sense, tiny musical instruments. In the interplay with light, they realize the mathematical music of the spheres that passes the vision of Pythagoras, Plato, and Kepler. In molecules and ordered materials, those atomic instruments play together as harmonious ensembles and synchronized orchestras. There is no logical reason to expect that the mathematics developed to understand music should have anything to do with atomic physics. Yet the same concept and equations turn out to govern both domains. Atoms are musical instruments and the light they emit makes their tones visible. Atoms emerge from the law and they emerge as beautiful objects. Physical atoms mathematically described as three-dimensional objects that will, to the animated spirit of an artist, yield images of exceptional beauty. And to show you how exact a science is occultism, says the Mahatma Kutumi, let me tell you that the means we avail ourselves of are all laid down for us in a code as old as humanity to the minutest detail. Our law, laws are as immutable as those of nature, and they were known to man an eternity before modern science was at. We build our philosophy on experiment and deduction. There is but one element, says the Mahatma Kutumi. This element then is the, so to speak, metaphysically, one substratum or permanent cause of all manifestations in the phenomenal universe. The ancients speak of the five cognizable elements, ether, fire, air, water, and earth. These basic cognizable elements are represented in the three-dimensional universe by the five platonic solids. The tetrahedron has four faces, four vertices, which are the points where the lines of the triangles, triangles face meet, and six edges. It stands for fire. It is fire, say the esoteric teachings, the most perfect and unadulterated reflection of the one flame. It is life and death, the origin and the end of every material thing. Fire is divine substance. And this fire of life was in every drop of the ocean of immortality. And the ocean was radiant light, which was fire, heat, and motion. Darkness vanished and was no more. It is appeared in its own essence. The octahedron stands for air, the intermediate between fire and water. It has eight triangular faces, six vertices and 12 edges coming together at each point or vertex. But it stands already on a square, symbolizing substance, through which it project, projects itself into a lower dimension. The icosahedron has 20 triangular faces, 12 vertices and 30 edges, five coming together at each vertex. According to Plato, it stands for water. In all cosmogonies, water is the base and source of all material existence. 
a term used in occultism in a generic sense and which is used in cosmogony with a metaphysical and mystical meaning, says HPB. Ice is not water, neither is stream, although all three have precisely the same chemical composition. The cube has six square faces, eight vertices, 12 edges, and three faces coming together at each vertex. The cube stands for earth or material existence. And finally, the dodecahedron, which has 12 pentagonal faces, 20 vertices and 30 edges, three faces coming together at each vertex. It is a dual of the icosahedron and the most mysterious and powerful of the five solids. Plato said it is cosmos itself. In a lecture called The Twelve Signs of the Zodiac, Suva Ro, a Hindu by birth and a theosophist at HPV's time, wrote that the universe is bound by pentagons in the symmetrical shape of a dodecahedron. That the macrocosm is similar to the microcosm, he says, and that the real universe of noumena is in certain passages of the Vedas and Upanishads represented by an icosahedron and that the dodecahedron and the icosahedron can exist within each other. In an article called The Shape of the Universe, published in the magazine The Economist, it was reported that Plato has been proved right when he taught that the figure of the whole universe was a dodecahedron. According to Dr. Jean-Pierre Luminet and his colleagues from the Paris Observatory, the universe is indeed a dodecahedron. They base their argument on data from the American satellite Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, which analyzed data from the microwave radiation shortly after the universe began. They say that the wavelength of this radiation is remarkably pure and that it has harmonics associated with it like a musical note. These harmonics, like those of a note, reflect the shape of the object in which the waves are generated. In the case of a musical note, that object is a musical instrument. In the case of the microwave background, that object is the universe itself. Dr. Lumines' calculation suggests that as a familiar dodecahedron has an inside and an outside, so does what he calls the dodecahedral space. Such a space has no boundary, even though it has a finite volume, and that it is quintessentially a dodecahedron, run up to the Greeks, he says. As quoted from Madame Blavatsky, numbers had limits to the formative hand of nature. Why are there just five platonic solids? Regular polyhedrons, like the platonic solids, are solid figures formed by flat surfaces. Every face, every edge length, every facial angle, as well as all the angles between two faces are equal to all the others that constitute the polyhedron. All planes are flat and not concave or dented in. Professor Frank Wilczek points out that by trying to add more than the above mentioned shapes which share a common vertex, we run out of space and cannot accommodate the accumulated angles anymore to complete a figure. It lies flat. The five platonic solids are the only finite regular solids possible. He is convinced that Plato's vision had already anticipated modern ideas, now at the forefront of scientific thinking, when he taught that the physical world is not the ultimate reality but that there is an eternal and timeless world of ideas which exist independently and prior to physical embodiment. So what role does man play in this amazing spectacle of the manifested universe? Are we really the focal points by which the universe becomes aware of itself and evolves? The first lesson taught in esoteric philosophy is that the incognizable cause does not put forth evolution, whether consciously or unconsciously, but only exhibits periodically different aspects of itself to the perception of finite minds. Evolution is commenced by the intellectual energy of the logos, sound or word. 
The light of the logos is the link between objective matter and subjective thought, the one instrument with which the logos works. And what is light? But the world illuminating and life-giving deity. Light is time. What from an abstraction has become a reality. If there were no light, you would not have time. The astral light or the ether of space preserves the images of all beings and things on its sensitized waves. And under certain atmospheric and electric conditions, pictures and subjective scenes, hence invisible under ordinary normal conditions, will be thrown out into objectivity. Space is the real world, while our world is an artificial one. It is the one unity throughout its infinitude in its bottomless depths as on its elusive surface, a surface studded with countless phenomenal universes, systems and mirage-like worlds. Nevertheless, to the Eastern occultist, who is an objective idealist at the bottom, in space is the real world. While our world is an artificial one, as a German mathematician and philosopher Leibniz would say, in his book, Parallel Worlds, Michio Kaku, physics professor at, university, at City University in New York, compares the manifestation of the universe with quantum theory, where every particle is associated with a wave. The wave tells you the probability of finding the particle at any point. The universe, when it was very young, was smaller than a subatomic particle. Therefore, the universe itself has perhaps a wave function. And since an electron can exist in many states at the same time, perhaps the universe also existed simultaneously in many states, described by a super wave function. Michio Kaku quoted from Nobel Prize laureate Steven Weinberg, who compared the multiple universe theory to a radio. All around us are hundreds of different radio waves broadcasting from different stations. If we turn on a radio, we can only listen to one frequency at a time. Likewise, in our universe, we are tuned into the frequency that corresponds to physical reality. But there is an infinite number of parallel realities coexisting with us, although we cannot hear them. Each has a different energy and frequency. Another interesting speculation comes from the American theoretical physicist, Professor John Wheeler which starts with the assumption that information is at the root of existence. When we look at the moon, a galaxy or an atom, the essence is in the information stored within them, which sprang into existence when the universe observed itself. He calls it participatory universe, the idea that the universe adapts to us in the same way that we adapt to the universe, that our very presence makes the universe possible. The mind reels when we realize that according to the interpretation of quantum mechanics, all possible worlds coexist with us, speculates Professor Michio Kaku. If this is true, why don't we see these alternate universes? This is where decoherence comes in. Our wave function has decohered with other worlds. The waves are no longer in phase with each other. This means the slightest contamination with the environment will prevent the various wave functions from interacting with each other. In his book, The Visionary Window, A Quantum Physicist's Guides to Enlightenment, Dr. Amit Goswami, Professor Emeritus of Nuclear Physics from the University of Oregon, tells us about what he calls monistic idealism, which is also known as Vedanta in India and the Tao in China. In the Eastern traditions of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism, a transcendent consciousness rather than matter is the ground of all being. All else is epiphenomena, or secondary phenomena occurring alongside the primary phenomena, matter and self included. Consciousness is both inside and outside of the material space-time reality. As transcendent or outside, it is pure unmanifested consciousness. Immanent or inside, it appears split as self and the world, subject and object. But this split or separateness is epiphenomenal, 
brought forth by a mysterious force called Maya, a power by which the universe becomes manifest. It is called forehead in Tibetan mythology, the essence of cosmic electricity. The most prominent proponents of monistic idealism in the West were Plato, Plotinus, Georg Friedrich, Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, from whose writings Madame Blavatsky quoted quite frequently, Immanuel Kant, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and Jakob Böhme. They pointed out that their philosophy is based on investigation, that consciousness can be known directly in its exclusive suchness, because we are that. Professor Goswami points out that science deals with phenomena, but spirituality is concerned with what is beyond phenomena. Stephen Hawking and other scientists have suggested that the early universe was a quantum object. The universe began as a wave function, the superposition of many baby universes of possibility. The assumption of a quantum universe solves the problem of a beginning. The answer is simple, there is no beginning. There's only possibility. The important question is how the possibility becomes actual. The universe of possibility exists in potential, but how does it manifest to become physical reality? In particle physics, it is said that measurement or observation collapses the wave function of an electron or any other material object. In monistic idealism, Consciousness transcends physical reality and collapses the wave function of the universe in an observation event. What or who are these conscious incipient forces in an observation event collapsing the wave function of possibilities? The one impersonal great architect of the universe is Mahat, the universal mind. And Mahavad is a symbol, an abstraction, an aspect which assumed a hazy entitative form in the all materializing conceptions of man. The divine mind is and must be before differentiation takes place. It is called the divine ideation, which is eternal in its potentiality and periodical in its potency when it becomes Mahat, Anima Mundi, or universal soul. But remember that, however you name it, each of these conceptions has its own metaphysical, most material and also intermediate aspects, says HPV. Universal mind is only another name for the absolute out of time and space. It is not an evolution, least of all a creation, but simply one of the aspects of the absolute, which knows no change whichever was, which is, and will be, probably derived from the term Abzu, a Chaldean expression for mystic space. The absolute is dormant latent mind itself and cannot be otherwise in true metaphysical perception. It is only its shadow which becomes differentiated in the collectivity of the Dhyanis or Ahi or the intelligent forces, which are the vehicle for the manifestation of the divine or universal thought and will, and which give to and enact in nature her law. They are not personifications of the powers of nature as erroneously thought, says HBB. In other words, behind the powers of nature, there is a transcendental force of intelligence that guides them. The German physicist and Nobel Prize laureate Max Planck, originator of the quantum theory of energy, came to the same conclusion when he said, as a physicist, that is a man who had devoted his whole life to a holy prosaic science, the exploration of matter, no one would surely suspect me of being a fantast. And so having studied the atom, I'm telling you that there is no matter as such. All matter arises and persists only due to a force that causes the atomic particles to vibrate. Holding them together in the tiniest of solar systems, the atom. Yet in the whole of the universe, there is no force that is either intelligent or eternal. And we must therefore assume that behind this force, there is a conscious, intelligent mind or spirit. 
This is the very origin of all matter. The universe is worked and guided from within outwards. As above, so it is below, as in heaven, so on earth. And man, the microcosm and miniature copy of the macrocosm, is a living witness to this universal law and to the mode of its action. There is design in the action of the seemingly blindest forces. The whole process of evolution with its endless adaptations is a proof of this. Three distinct representations of the universe in its three distinct aspects are impressed upon our thought by the esoteric philosophy, the pre-existing evolved from the ever-existing, and the phenomenal, the world of illusion, the reflection and shadow thereof. During the great mystery and drama of life known as the Manvantara, our real cosmos is like the object placed behind the white screen upon which are thrown the Chinese shadows called forth by the magic lantern, HPB referring to Plato. The actual figures and things remain invisible while the wires of evolution are pulled by the unseen hand. And men and things are thus but the reflection on the white field of the realities behind the snares of Mahamaya or the great illusion. This was taught in every philosophy, in every religion, ante as well as post diluvian in India and Chaldea by the Chinese as by the Grecian sages. To put it plainly, says HBB, ether is the astral light and the primordial substance is akasha, the upadi or vehicle of divine thought. In modern language, the latter, akasha, would be better named cosmic ideation or spirit. The former, ether or astral light, cosmic substance or matter. These, the alpha and the omega of being, are but the two facets of the one absolute existence. There is one great difference between the astral light and the akasha which must be remembered. The latter is eternal, the former is periodic. The astral light changes not only with every Mahaman Vantaras, but also with every sub-period and planetary cycle around. The prototypes or ideas of things exist first on the plane of divine eternal consciousness and thence become reflected and reversed in the astral light, which also reflects on its lower individual plane the life of our Earth, recording it on its tablets. Therefore is the astral light called illusion. Every molecule is a mirror of the universe. Every microcosm is a mirror of a macrocosm. As the esoteric philosophy teaches us, the astral light is simply the dregs of Akasha or the universal ideation in its physical sense. When after unimaginable cycles of time, absolute truths, having conquered relative truths, the inhabitants of the mysterious region are thus supposed to have reached the state called in mystic phraseology, Svasam Vidana, or the self-analyzing reflection, and Paramasa, or that absolute consciousness of the personal emerged into the impersonal ego, which is above all, hence above illusion in every sense. The evolutionary goal is reached and the preconditions are set for the next Manvantara to start from after an equally long period of rest. The secret doctrine teaches the progressive development of everything, worlds as well as atoms. And this stupendous development has neither conceivable beginning or imaginable end. Our universe is only one of an infinite number of universes, links in the great cosmic chain of universes, each one standing in the relation of an effect as regards its predecessor and being a cause as regards its successor. The appearance and disappearance of the universe are pictured as an outbreathing and inbreathing of the great breath, which is eternal, and which, be motion, is one of the three aspects of the absolute, abstract space and duration being the other two. When the great breath, one existence, breathes out a thought, 
this thought becomes cosmos. So also, is it when the divine breath is inspired again, the universe disappears into the bosom of the great mother of nature, who then sleeps, rests, wrapped in her invisible robes. The eternity of the universe in total is a boundless plane. Periodically, the playground of numberless universes incessantly manifesting and disappearing. Like a wink of the eye of self-existence, the appearance and disappearance of worlds is like a regular tidal ebb of flux and reflux. Light is the first begotten and the first emanation of the Supreme, and light is life. Both are electricity, the life principle, the anima mundi pervading the universe, the electric vivifier of all things. Light is a great protein magician. And under the divine will of the architect, the demiurgos or third logos, its multifarious omnipotent waves gave birth to every form as well as to every living being. From its swelling electric bosom springs matter and spirit. Within its beams lie the beginnings of all physical and chemical action and of all cosmic and spiritual phenomena. It vitalizes and disorganizes. It gives life and produces death. And from its primordial point gradually emerge into existence the myriads of worlds, visible and invisible celestial bodies. It was at the ray of this first mother, one in three, which is not the cause of either light or heat, but merely the focus or lens by which the rays of the primordial light become materialized, concentrated upon our solar system, producing all the correlations of forces. The mathematical point called the cosmic seed, the monad of Leibniz, which contains the whole universe as the acorn, the oak. This is the first bubble on the surface of boundless homogeneous substance or space the bubble of differentiation in its incipient stage. It is the beginning of the Orphic Obama's egg. At the very early stage in the development of the Theosophical Movement in India, a document of valuable instruction was passed on to some of the principal workers of that day, known as the Letter of the Mahachohan. It says right on the first page that the doctrine we promulgate, being the only true one must support it by such evidence as we are preparing to give, become ultimately triumphant like every other truth. Yet it is absolutely necessary to inculcate it gradually, enforcing its theories, unimpeachable facts for those who know, with direct inference deduced from and corroborated by the evidence furnished by modern exact science. I would like to close now, now with a chapter, The Path to the Heart of the Universe, from Dr. Puruga's book of Golden Precepts, where it says, there is a hunger in every human heart which nothing can satisfy or appease, a hunger for the real, a hunger for the sublime, it is a nostalgia of the spirit soul of man. The source of this homesickness is brought about by the soul memory of our spiritual abode, whence we came and towards which we are now on our return journey. Men unconsciously, intuitively, unknown to the brain mind, see the vision sublime on the mountain tops of the mystic East. Every human heart feels this yearning homesickness for the indescribable, the immortal, the deathless, for unutterable peace which is frontierless in each reaches, being the saving power in man which gives them hope and aspiration, raising their soul with the recognition of the glory that once was theirs. There is a pathway of wisdom and illumination which begins in any incarnation of each being right on this earth in the present life. The pathway of conscious and spiritual realization, leading ever inward towards the mystic East, which is the heart of the universe. This path is one and yet different for every human being, because every human being is himself that path. It is the very core of him, built of thought and consciousness, 
the very fabric of his own being, the stuff of nature's heart. Man is an inseparable part of the universe in which he lives, moves, and has his being. The same life flows through all things that are. The stream of consciousness that flows through the mighty whole of the universe flows therefore also through man, an inseparable portion of the universe, the pathway by which you may come into intimate relation with the heart of the universe itself is you yourself, your own being, your own nature, your spiritual self, not that of ordinary man, which is just a pure reflection of the spiritual brilliance within. It is that inner path of self, of pure consciousness, pure love for all that is, unstained by any earthly taint, your spiritual being, following this path to your own inner God, your higher self, you will reach the mysteries and wonders of boundless infinitude through infinite time. Such happiness, peace, bliss, beauty, love and inspiration will fill your whole being, that every breath will be a blessing and every thought a sublime inspiration. Mm. Oh my goodness. Peace <laughs> be with you. Oh, Miss Patra, I just love you. That was so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, Petra Meyer, always, as always, you deliver and you pack such an incredible punch. I want to say for those of you who are watching, you don't have to memorize any of that. That it's theosophy is ancient divine knowledge, divine science. If you are attracted to what is going on here, watch this over and over again. Go back and visit the quotes and see how they feel when you uh, tap in to explore more. Petra has put together a phenomenal presentation of quotes of science, quantum physics, mathematics, uh, but we do talk about how theosophy is compassion and love and unity. This is the origin of the universe. These texts came in and they have been coming in throughout the millennia, but there is a huge portion that came through at the end of the 19th century. Um, and now we are reaping from that harvest and we are planting more seeds out there because you're here for a reason. If you're watching this channel, if you're watching this episode, it's not by mistake. So please go back and revisit that. Watch it, listen to it if you want to on 75% so you can hear it slowly and let it process. Um, Petra, I, I don't know how to thank you for the work that you do. Oh. <laughs> I, I just put together what um, very um, enlightened people mm. have told us, and it shows us, like the Mahatma, the Mahatma says, it will be all um, confirmed by modern exact science, and especially the quantum physicists um, are all inspired by mysticism and they all know about eastern philosophies and uh, uh, have studied buddhism hinduism whatever a few even read the secret doctrine but oh, they would not yeah. admit, admit it probably <laughs> well that's it, it shows because we're getting to a point where now science is catching up with this ancient truth. So we have a proof coming up in the modern world and people are looking uh, beyond the churches, beyond these organized religions. This is a commonality of all the world's religions, sciences, and philosophies. That's what theosophy is. And that's what both Petra and I are doing here. We are simply students of theosophy who wish to share this with you so you can find it as well and then apply it in your life. So again, there was a ton of scientific explanation in this presentation, but you don't have to memorize that. It's not important. What's important is you can find out the answers and then when you revisit it more answers are revealed and you'll probably be left with more questions but if you're looking for where who what why we are what you are uh, this is all about you that's what theosophy is so if you have any questions please drop in the in the comment sections i've included some of petra's um quotes in the uh, description down below but look up the quotes yourself uh, let this be uh, an ember to start your own fire so you can begin your own search in these theosophical teachings. And it isn't just us that's doing it. There's a lot of folks coming forward that have found that theosophy has changed their life and they wish to be of service. And that's all that we are doing here. So I cannot thank you enough, sweet Petra.
Are there any thoughts that we didn't cover in this presentation that you would like to add before we come to a, a close? Because there was so much, there's so much in there. I mean, what you ever have to remember that um, we are just presenting information and what you said, you have to work on it yourself. There's always some, not all of it probably, but there's always something which comes up which speaks to your heart and to your mind. And then you have to follow it up. And as we said yesterday in our study group at Blavatsky Lodge, you know, we have to build a bridge, you know, which is called Antaskarana in mm -hmm. uh, Sanskrit. Um, that is the bridge I always remind me of the neck here. Yeah. Um, and what Carl Jung calls the archetypes, you know, mm -hmm. The more we think of something and meditate on something, our vibrations change. And then uh, we slip into higher levels of consciousness. And then these archetypes start to speak to us, you know, speak in the metaphorical sense. You know, yes. we get and you're drawn to it. You're yeah. watching this. You're, you're drawn yeah. to it. And the yeah. Antakarana that she's talking about, also called yeah. the Antaskarana, is the, uh, it is the bridge between your higher and lower self. Yeah, and, um, exactly. A lot of times I've described on this channel, instead of using the term God and man, you can think of higher self and lower self. All of this is taking place inside you. Yes. you know, she's talking about um, uh, the microcosm, the macrocosm. This is not something that is beyond you or in another location. It's happening right now inside you, right. inside right. you. So you are essential. You who are watching this, this is all about you. That's what theosophy is. And it was to be boiled down into one word where you hear the compassion, the unconditional love. There's so much here. So Petra Meyer, the president of the Blavatsky Lodge in London, is a favorite guest here on the Living Theosophy channel. <laughs> look forward to having you again. And if you'd like to study more, I've attached links to free books like The Voice of the Silence that she has quoted. But go out and look on your own and understand the term theosophy, theos gods, Sophia wisdom. This is the ancient wisdom that belongs to all beings here on our planet. We're in a place of great suffering. There's a lot of suffering on this planet. By bringing these teachings forward, you can change your life by putting them into application, which thereby affects all of those around you. So it's imperative that you put this into practice. It's not about, um, you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to. Um, but you can understand as you listen to what she's brilliantly said in this presentation, uh, watch it over and over again, and just know that you're not alone. There's many of us out there that want to bring these teachings forward. We're simply students with you. We share that path with you because we are all the path. So thank you, Petra Meyer. We look oh, forward to seeing you again. Um, and uh, we will go ahead and close this. And again, we'll be in the live chat with you, but uh, we'll have more presentations coming up here on the Living Theosophy channel. And again, so much. There's a lot of, uh, during the, um, uh, the COVID lockdown, a lot of theosophical groups have gone online. And so there's meetings all over the place. It's inspiring to see young theosophists come forward. There's a lot of youth coming forward, finding uh, or looking to find the answers that they're looking for that are no longer in these churches or organizations. They're here inside you so it's actually all about you i can't say that enough petra i love you sweetheart we will see you again soon i love you all too <laughs> you. i'll see you yeah, later okay. remember the secret doctrine okay you don't have it's not a, a journey of the mind it's a journey of the heart it's a journey of the heart thank you sweetheart we love you namaste. good night <laughs> namaste bye-bye namaste. sweetie we love bye -bye. you bye-bye honey